country which has one of the most popular cuisines in the world. Where people snack 24 hours a day and the words fast food take on a whole new meaning. Welcome to Thailand. Thai food is a feast for all the senses. Thailand offers a sweet and spicy cuisine. From simple seasonal dishes, the latest year of fusion, to centuries-old palace recipes, Thai cooking has achieved its distinctive style by blending its own ideas with the best of other Asian countries. The result? A unique cuisine with worldwide appeal. Thai food is one of my all-time favourite cuisines, and my mission is to find out what makes their dishes so original and utterly irresistible. My journey takes me from the sizzling streets of Bangkok to the central plains around Ayutthaya, then up to the cool north of Chiang Mai, and lastly south to Chum Pon for some seriously hot seafood. Thailand's sprawling capital Bangkok is home to seven and a half million people and brings together culinary styles from all corners of the kingdom. Now this is Mrs. Beer, and she's just one of a thousand mobile street vendors who every day turns Bangkok's very busy street into an incredible food bazaar. Around a hundred years ago, the street market or Talat was the only place Thais could buy food if they didn't grow it themselves. Slowly an entire subculture developed. Today, street food is part of everyday life in Thailand. Now you can find practically every single item from the sweet and spicy Thai kitchen out here on the street. Now Liam and I have spent 40 very hot minutes getting here to this very busy Bangkok street. And now I'm going to get even hotter cooking her famous banana fritters. Now these are slices of bananas dropped in this delicious little batter which is made with coconut milk, sesame seeds, rice flour and a little bit of water. So I'm going to cook myself a couple here. <laughs> Careful not to burn myself in the process. And then I'm going to wait for them to go lovely and brown and crispy and I'm going to try. Now it's my favourite bit, the tasting time. Oh, they're so crispy. Oh, they're quite hot. Mmm, I'm right. <laughs> It's like toffee on the inside, and there's sesame coconut batter on the outside. Absolutely delicious. Naughty, but very, very nice. <laughs> the influence of the Chinese is apparent in all Asian food, and Thailand is no different. Over the centuries, Chinese immigrants have come here in large numbers, making Bangkok's Chinatown a vital part of the city's cuisine. What were once rare Chinese delicacies have now become ordinary ingredients of Thai cuisine. Now one delicacy which originated in China but is equally popular here now is the bird's nest soup. It comes from the swiftlet bird and the actual nests are made from their solidified saliva. Very strange indeed, thank you. But apparently if I eat this soup it's going to give me a spring in my step and make my hair shiny. So here goes. My God, that's really amazing. It's like the, the, the nesty bit is almost like a noodle. Quite simple, and it's in a sort of sweet stock, and it's really actually quite tasty. I'm surprised. Now, this is a first for me. These are known as thousand-year-old eggs. Now, that's because they've been fermented in a soy, and a wood chip mixture, very strange I know. And it's probably not for a thousand years, but for a pretty long time. Now I'm gonna dive in and give these a try. Wow, such a matte color. It is completely black and it's got the consistency of like a jelly. I can't believe how black this is. Okay, come on, these be bold. I'm definitely going to stick to boiled eggs in the future. 
In Thailand, everyone eats on the street. The food is varied, clean and very tasty. So if you want to try classic Thai dishes such as green curry, red curry or deep fried fish, then it's a great place to start. And cheap too, with everything under $2 a dish. Andrew's lived in Thailand for 13 years. He took me to his favourite street restaurant. In Thailand, people eat around the clock and there are no set meal times at all. Now, I'm here with Andrew, who's chosen some classic Thai dishes for me to try. What's Let's the do. first thing you've chosen for me? OK, this is Tard Man, which is fish, fish, fish I cones. love these. You probably okay. tried these already. Yeah, and no, I have tried these before, but not in Thailand. This is a snack. I mean, if you're just walking down the street, if you want to act like a Thai, you just point at these and say, I'll take a, a, a half a dozen of these. Now, the second thing you've chosen for me is a Pad Thai, which is a classic. Thai noodle dish, isn't it? It has all the Thai ingredients in it. You have hot, spicy, you have sweet, uh, you have sour, and you have all those rolled into one. It's got everything. It's got the noodles, it's got the garlic, it's got the chilies, and it's all there thrown into one with a bit of spring onions and, and, some, and, and some banana palm, and it's just fantastic. Wow. And then, they're not, aren't I supposed to add even more to it? Because these condiments here, you see on every single restaurant table, right, don't you? Right, right. Well, these condiments sum up Thai food, because you must have, in all Thai food, you must have chilies, hot, you must have sweet, which is the sugar, and generally you also have something that's a little a little bit um, sour, they okay. call prio, which so, is the vinegar. So, spoonful of chili, that goes on, yeah? Well, if you want to be a real Thai, you'll have to put an, about another, <laughs> one more of those on there, Merrily. Well, there you go. Only been here a short while. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, and then some sugar, now that's to even it up, isn't it? Yeah, that's okay. to even it up. So put a bit of sugar on there, okay. like that, that's right. And then yep. you have vinegar, and that's a, that's a vinegar with some chilies in it. How is it? Have you ever eaten that amount of chilies before in one go in your life? Wow. <laughs> That's hot. I'm heading out of Bangkok up the Chow Phraya River. This is the most traditional route out of a city once known as the Venice of the East, a place which until late last century was little more than a maze of charming wooden houses linked by clongs or canals. To get an idea of what old Siam was like, I'm taking a trip to one of its floating markets, the Dam Non Saduk. In contrast to most other floating markets in Thailand run solely for the tourists, the Dam Non Saduk is fairly authentic. Female traders sell freshly picked produce straight from the farm. Some even have floating kitchens with noodle steamers on board, which they diligently work whatever the weather, as I soon found out. Thailand, people eat small bowls of noodles whenever they're a little bit peckish. These noodles are mainly made from rice flour. And there's two words worth remembering. Nam, which means wet, and hang, which means dry. Can I have fat noodles hang? I think I've just asked the fat noodles dry. We'll see. Oh, we've got some, oh, those fat noodles look delicious. And she's blanched the um, bean sprouts in her chicken stock here. Oh, she's putting on some dried garlic, crunchy prawns, some pork, some coriander, fish sauce. Again, a little oh, peanuts, a little bit of sugar, chili. some dried chili, oh. yes. Ah, oh, lime juice, some wontons and some crispy prawns. Oh, I'm doing very well. Ooh, thank you. Okay. It's gonna be hot. Mmm. Wow. The fat noodles, because they're wider, are much more coated in the kind of sugar and the peanut. The peanuts add nuttiness and it's a little bit spicy with the chili. Absolutely delicious. Now, my last one to try are wet noodles. So can I have skinny noodles? Nam. Okay. Ooh. It's only been a few days, I'm nearly through it in Thai. 
It's amazing how quickly they cook. I mean, they're literally just dropped in there. It's such instant food. And we've got the bean sprouts again, and more garlic. Lots of garlic today. It'll keep the cold off. <laughs> some meat, some chicken, some pork, some beef. Coriander. Fish sauce. Ah, oh, now this is um, the pork meat, which is in sort of slightly vinegary stock. Ah, and this is the soupy bit. Yummy. Ooh, what's this? Ah, oh, black pepper. Oh, oh. Yummy. Oh, thank you. Okay. These noodles in the middle. That's so good, perfect for this weather. It's completely different because you've got this wonderful sort of soupy broth. Um, it's not spicy or nearly as sweet, but very, very sort of comforting and the broth, it's incredible, it's something so simple, can be so delicious. I think I need to move in, away from the rain, and carry on eating my bowl of noodles. Thank you. About 50 miles down river is the Grand Palace of Bangkok. This is home to one of Thailand's best-known cuisines, Royal Palace Cuisine. Built in the late 18th century is a home for the Thai royal family. The palace was originally a self-sufficient city which enjoyed its own particular cooking style. Court recipes were jealously guarded from the outside world and shared only with the chosen few. Today, the royal family no longer stay in the palace, but their recipes live on here at the Institute of Culinary Arts. If Royal Palace is used in the name of a Thai restaurant, it normally means the chef has been trained in the unique art of palace cookery. This is taught here at the Royal Palace and they're letting me sit in on a lesson. Royal Palace cuisine focuses on time-consuming presentation and attention to detail. It's girls only who train for up to three years. The school is so respected that it attracts pupils from all over the world. Today is a class on dessert making and fruit carving. cuisine, they use fruit and vegetable carvings as decoration in the same way that we might use herbs or flowers. And any big feast or festival that goes on in the palace, the people here will make them. And I'll tell you something, they won't be using mine. <laughs> the practice of fruit carving was once the preserve of the women of the royal court. But today, many Thais know the basic carving skills, although few can master the advanced techniques of the royal palace school. I don't think mine looks anything like the girls next door. I can't believe how quiet they are in this class. It's very intensive. Royal Thai cuisine used to be served only in the Thai court. However, in the late 1960s, King Bumibol opened the palace cookbooks to the rest of his kingdom. I mean, it's not surprising I'm having difficulty doing this. The course is actually a year long to do the fruit carving, which is a pretty long time. And Marilise, after 10 minutes, is obviously... Um, Struggling. Oh, little rose petal on the top. Thank you. Well, I don't think she thought I did too badly for my first attempt. And I have to say, it might not be as good as these two, but I'm pretty proud of that. Look. After my very tricky lesson at the school, I make a rather royal encounter. Now, I'm here with Chef McDang, who not only is a descendant of the Thai royal family, he's also a celebrity chef here. Right. So what are you going to cook for me today with this mango? It's going to be a, a savoury dish, a fried fish, right. simple fried fish with a mango salsa. First thing McDang is doing is shredding the mango, julienne style, which means chopping it through to the stone, then slicing it into thin shreds. 
Next, we add some chilies to the pestle and mortar. And I'm just literally bashing it so that I break the outside, but I don't break pulp it. them. Just the right. releasing the seeds. Then we throw the chilies in with the mango. For seasoning, McDang adds salty fish sauce and then balances it out with the sweetness of two tablespoons of sugar. And then taste. You, you always want to taste this thing. But it's important to okay, taste it. Okay, yes, of course. Okay. It should be salty and sweet. Mm. Mm. Is it salty? Mm. Too salty? No, 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 it's not. It's perfect balance. Okay. Next, finely chopped shallots are thrown in with the juice of two limes to add a zingy zest to the salsa. Mmm, I've got sugar, salty, and sort of soury, Sour. citrusy. Right. Mm. Finally, McDang adds roughly chopped sawtooth coriander and finely shredded spring onions, not only for flavour but colour and texture. Wow, it looks fantastic and has only taken a couple of minutes to make. Now, McDowell, you're going to cook the fish. This is a snake fish. Now, I've never seen a snake fish right. before, but we could use other fish, couldn't you? You can. You can use catfish, which you have in yep. where you come from, and we can use um, snapper would be fine. OK, and what about something like um, in a cod? Any firm-fleshed white fish would be quite good with it. Any fish that is not fatty would be fine. McDang then lowers the boned and filleted fish into very hot palm oil. Now, if you were worried about deep frying, you could pan fry this, couldn't you? You can pan fry it. You can just, uh, what you have to do is just uh, dredge it in a little bit of flour. Wow, and then skin side skin down. Skin side down. And then what you need to do is also um, don't use uh, a wok. You just use a flat, flat pan, flat heavy pan. base pan. Right. But you know, in Thailand, we, we, we have two kitchens. Two kitchens? Because the oil is very, very, very hot and it splatters all over the place. And <laughs> our food, you know, our food is very fragrant. So we have an outside kitchen <laughs> and an indoor kitchen. So it doesn't smell of a uh, curry so, and fry. That's right. So you could just <laughs> let it splatter all over the place if you wanted to. It's OK. After roughly two minutes on each side, the fish is golden and cooked through. Shake off any excess oil and simply present it on a platter with a bowl of salsa at the side. Now what you do is you take okay. some of this salsa. I'm not going to have those two chilies, are you? OK, I'll take them out. <laughs> Glad you're not adventurous. <laughs> and then you, you put it in here. But be careful, it's hot. Yeah, right, I, I, I'm ready. Mmm! <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you're mm. my, my hero, Madame, <laughs> is so delicious. It's amazing. It's so crispy on the outside, but the flesh of the fish is soft. And then you've got salty and sweet and sour, and then the freshness of the herbs. It is absolutely perfection on a plate. You've what? made me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Good food is better than sex. Sometimes, <laughs> they say. Heading two hours up river to the temple city of Ayutthaya. Although much of Ayutthaya is now in ruins, it was once the capital of Thailand. Its landscape is still dominated by countless temples or wats, dating back to the 14th century. Thais connect food with all important aspects of their lives. So in a country where over 90% of the population is Buddhist, it's little surprise that food plays an important role in their religious ceremonies. I'm here at the festival of the Sakha Puja, which marks the birth, enlightenment and death of Buddha. It's celebrated in temples throughout the land with offerings of curry, rice, fruit and sweets to the monks. 
Buddhist monks are forbidden to cook for themselves and they must rely on the charity of others for their every meal. They never eat more than two meals a day and they mustn't have anything between midday and midnight. No matter how hungry this makes them feel, Buddha also teaches that they must show restraint when eating and see food as a purely functional act with no pleasure attached to it. After looking at all that food, I've worked up quite an appetite. So luckily I've been invited to lunch with a local family. I'm here with my friend Son, who's making a Thai red curry as an offering for the monks. There's no gadgets here. This is the truly authentic Thai way of making curry. And I'm going to have to try and remember a little bit of Thai here. So Son, what's my first ingredients? First thing Son asks for is the zest of kaffir lime. Next, galangal is added. This is related to the ginger family. This is followed by lesser ginger, which is a smaller, younger ginger. Plenty of garlic is then pounded in, and finally, loads of dried chili added. Oh, yeah. Modeling. Uh. <gasps> All of it. <laughs> Now the paste is ready, it's time to bring on the oven. This is a classic way of cooking here in Thailand. We've got a fire come barbecue, and we're using the fuel, which is the husks of coconut and charcoal. First thing to add to the very hot wok is the coconut cream, which will act as our oil. After a minute or two, it has reduced to a dense cream. Now we add our freshly made curry paste. Let the paste simmer in the coconut cream for around three minutes until an oil forms around the outside. Then it's time to add the chicken. Now it's really important here that the chicken is fried in the paste. It absorbs some of the flavour. We're just going to seal the chicken before we add our coconut milk. Add a generous amount of the light coconut milk as this will make the curry sauce. Bring to a simmer and allow to bubble for five minutes. I've got these baby eggplants, they're like pea-sized and they're really similar to the eggplant but because they're so fresh, they've been put locally, they just need to go in at the last minute. We're also going to add... Oh, are they going now? We're ready? Oh, they can go in now. The curry is seasoned with fish sauce. Finally, whole chilies and holy basil are added. And there you have it, Thai red curry made the authentic way. This smells so fantastic. It's our rice. Mmm, smells delicious. Okay, I'm gonna taste, yeah? Fruits of our labor. Wow, that is the best red curry I have ever had. I can't believe the difference of one I've had before. I'm sure it's because all these ingredients are so fresh. They've been pounded by hand. The coconut milk's been made by hand. It is mind-blowing. I'm very, very happy. red curry, Son used coconuts grown locally. Coconut palms are found all over the country, but particularly on the coast. They are the most important tree in the Thai kingdom. 
Coconuts are really important to Thailand. They're also very difficult to pick because they're right at the top of these trees. But the Thais have come up with an ingenious way of collecting them. especially trained to pick only ripe coconuts. They work for up to eight hours a day and they can collect as many as a thousand coconuts in one shift. The use of coconut milk in Thai cooking was introduced by Portuguese explorers in the 16th century who missed dairy products so much they suggested to local chefs that they find an alternative. Now after all his hard work, I think my furry friend here deserves a little bit of a snack. So I've got him a banana. Oh, he's got a bit of a cold. He's got very big teeth as well. Oh. In Thailand, coconut cream and milk are usually made at home in the traditional way. First, the coconut flesh is grated, then mixed with water and squeezed by hand. This first squeezing is then drained to form coconut cream. More water is then added and the process repeated. This thinner strain liquid is known as coconut milk. An essential ingredient in Thai cooking, the coconut is used in curries, rice, creams and desserts. At a night market, three hours drive outside Ayutthaya, there's a chance to try coconut in some of its most delicious forms. Now I'm here at the bussing Prapatom Jedi night market, where coconut takes on a truly decadent meaning. There are yummy, sticky, delicious desserts everywhere, and I'm ready to get stuck in. Hi, uh, one please. Now, sweet sticky rice with fresh mango is a classic dessert here in Thailand. Now, sticky rice is a slightly unusual type of rice. It's slightly thicker, more starchy, which makes it really sticky. And in this case, it's been cooked with coconut milk and sugar. It's served with fresh mango and more coconut milk drizzled all over the top, and it looks delicious. Wow, look at this. Mmm! I can't tell you, that is absolutely delicious. The rice is sticky and sweet. The cream on top, the coconut is really condensed and the mango just adds a citrusy taste. It's absolutely fantastic. But I've got to show you something. This mad dessert here, it might look like tar, but in fact, this is made from the skin of coconuts, which have been caramelized with sugar. And then they've added a kind of natural gelatin. And they have it with more fresh coconut. I and mean, it looks bonkers, but I'm going to give it a try anyway. Really kind of weird consistency, but here goes. Mmm. Mmm. Interesting. Very kind of gluey taste. Very sweet. I think I'm going to stick with my mango and rice. Another popular treat is this sweet crispy wafer with preserved coconut. Now she's putting this batter on. This is um, a mixture of rice flour and sugar and eggs. Oh, now this white stuff, this looks like cream, but in fact, this is um, rice flour worked up really, really, really thickly with sugar. Now this orange stuff that's going on now is this coconut, which has been flavored slightly, and it's the most wonderful orange color. Oh, we've got some toasted peanuts. It's delicious. That looks very easy. They look delicious. It's amazing. They're so warm, but they go crisp, crispy almost instantly. They're taken off the heat. Mmm. It's a cross between like a wafer and a biscuit. And it does taste meringue, the rice flour in the middle. And a coconut, which looks like carrot, does taste really coconutty. And the nuts add a little bit of crunch. It's delicious. Now I'm taking the train up to Thailand's second city, Chiang Mai. 
Set in the north, this is where many of the country's most common herbs are grown. The cooler, wetter climate and lush green hills make perfect conditions for growing kaffir lime, galangal and lemongrass, which are key Thai flavours. Because the lush climate is so important here, the locals hold a Buddhist festival every year to ask for rain. For a week in May, thousands of devotees pour into Chiang Mai's main temple to place flowers at the feet of Buddha and pray for rain. The festival is accompanied by a food fair which offers an array of local specialities. It's the seventh day of the Interkin Festival and people have been praying here all week for rain and it looks like they're about to be very successful. Now I've come in search of these. These are a very traditional food here in Chiang Mai. It's a spicy sausage. Looks kind of western but... Mmm! When you bite into it, it is like Thailand on a stick. Spicy, lemony and frankly... If it rains, it's going to be the perfect food. Oh, doesn't this look pretty? In our little banana leaf there, we've got some egg and some spring onions. But in fact, this is a bee's lava souffle, which apparently is a speciality here in Chiang Mai. I'm going to give it a taste. Mmm, that's not too bad at all. Now, insects are all over Thailand, and I quite like the philosophy that if it's in abundance, eat it. So I thought I'd give them a try. Now, apparently, these are silkworms. Quite posh sounding. Hmm, that wasn't too bad at all. Move on to this one. Doesn't look quite as nice. Let's see if I can find a little one. Nice, <laughs> <laughs> <I> absolutely. <laughs> Putting the memories of my insect experience well behind me, I decided to turn to things more delicately Thai. Anan is a local chef and he's going to teach me how to cook one of Thailand's best loved dishes, Tom Yum Soup, made with lemongrass, galangal and kaffir lime leaves, all grown locally, of course. Yes, yes. Now we're back from the market with our delicious looking galangal, lime leaves and lemongrass. I'm going to make one of Thailand's most celebrated soups, the Tom Yum. Now it's one of my favourites, Anan, and you're going to show me the very authentic way of making it. First thing Anan does is chop a stick of lemongrass. He then adds it to hot chicken stock. Next, he slices and adds galangal. He then picks a few leaves from the kaffir lime, the freshest I've ever smelt. Okay. Wow, it's amazing, you break it, it's like limes, it's fantastic. Yeah, you have to tear it apart. And you're tearing again, not chopping. Not chopping. Because that releases it's... more flavour by tearing. Right. Easier as well. No chopping at all, it's great. Anan gets me to chop two shallots and add them to the stock. Next, sweet roasted chilli paste. Can I taste? Sure. so sweet, I'm surprised. Mm, that's delicious. Add one teaspoon of the paste and some of the oil. This will give the soup its lovely red colour. As always, fish sauce is added for seasoning. Then lime juice. It is amazing. The lime juice here is so sweet. It's different. It's not nearly as sort of acidic. It's much softer flavour, isn't it? Now roughly chop two tomatoes. If anybody was going to try a Thai recipe at home, it's absolutely the recipe to try. You can get almost all these ingredients back home. 
The dish is almost ready. All that's left to add are straw mushrooms, some very fiery green chilies, and then, of course, the prawns. Most important, leave the little tails on at the end because it makes them much easier to eat. And they've just been spit down the back and cleaned and then peeled, which makes them look pretty and much, much easier to eat. Simply drop them in and turn off the heat. The soup is hot enough to turn the prawns pink and cook them to perfection. Finally, throw in a handful of torn coriander. A few spring onions. And that's it. Tom Yum soup. Now it's time to see if Anand's Tom Yum lives up to my expectations. So what do they say for sort of happy eating in Thai? Aroima. Okay, aroima. Mm. <laughs> it is if you bite into a chili. Oh, okay, you bite into the chili. It's delicious. South to try some fish in the coastal town of Chimpon. But to start my seafood experience, I'm stopping off in Bangkok at the seafood market and restaurant. The seafood restaurant is a Bangkok institution. It operates as something of a cross between a supermarket, cafeteria and restaurant. Shoppers choose their fish, pay for it at the cash desk, then have it cooked for them on the spot. about this place I get to choose what seafood I have, how it's cooked and I get a personal shopper into the bargain. Fish is more important to the Thai diet than poultry, beef or pork. In fact, after rice, it's Thailand's main staple. The country has two completely different seas, the Gulf of Thailand and the Adaman, which offer a huge variety of seafood, many of which I've never seen before. Wow, that is amazing. That's a Phuket lobster. Yes. Now this has got to be the supermodel of lobsters. Check out those colours. It's the most incredible blue. I almost want to wear this lobster. I'm tempted to buy it, but to be really honest with you, that would be being very, very greedy. Check these out. These are the biggest crab girls I've ever seen, and I've got to try them. of these. These are green-lit mussels, as you can see from their wonderful colour, and I think they're going to be delicious. I've chosen so much seafood, I've only got room for a couple of veggies. So I've picked Morning Glory, which is a really traditional Thai veggie, and something I've never seen before. This sprouting stuff here apparently is the tops of bitter cucumbers. Never tried it before, but apparently it's delicious. So, it's time to go get cooking. There you go. Now that's come to $46, which means it's not the cheapest meal here in Bangkok, but I can tell you something, these ingredients are fantastic. So I think probably it's going to be one of the best. Thank you. Thai insistence on freshness is best shown here. Chefs use simple cooking methods such as wok frying, roasting and steaming to ensure the wonderful fresh flavours are kept locked in. In just under 10 minutes, all my food is ready. Grilled lobster, wok fried mussels, steamed crab, and the perfect side dish, fried vegetables. Now I could have had this seafood cooked any way I wanted, char grilled, broiled, sautéed, deep fried, but I went along with the chef's recommendation and look at this, what an incredible feast. I'm not quite sure where to start. I think I'll start with the mussel. Cheers.
Mile coastline is home to a wealth of fantastic seafood. Sea bass, shark, cottonfish, cuttlefish, and all kinds of shellfish are just some of the bounty that the seas of Thailand have to offer. As in the rest of the world, Thai fishermen are deeply superstitious, praying to Mai Yanan, the goddess of water. They cover the front of their boats in coloured scarves in her honour. One of the things the goddess teaches is that fish should never be grilled on board because the smell of the burning flesh would make their other fish swim away. Now I've hitched a ride on this fishing boat to try my luck at some squid catching. And I tell you something, it's really not that very high tech. Two neon lights here which are going to track the squid to the surface, a bottle and a hook, and that's it. And apparently I'm going to be reeling them in in minutes. Tell you something, it's a bit like a squid disco around here. Squid trapping is an ancient technique which works on the principle that the creature is attracted to the light and gets hooked on its way up to the surface. The problem is, it's a lot harder than it sounds. <gasps> I felt something, I felt something, I think I've got one. OK, OK, I'm going to reel it in. <laughs> I think I've got one. Coming up. I have, I have, I've definitely got one. <laughs> no, I haven't. An hour later and still not a bite. Oh, I've got one, I've got one, I've got one, I've got one. Ah! <laughs> okay, okay. this squid last night so of course I'm going to use it in a recipe. I'm going to make char grilled squid with a herb salad and a lime and chilli dressing. And the first thing I need to do is score my squid. This is really important because it helps the squid cook really quickly and it also helps the wonderful flavours of the marinade really permeate the flesh. Now I'm not using a very sharp knife here, I'm just using a normal table knife because you don't want to go all the way through, that's quite important. Next I'm going to marinate these in a roasted chilli paste. This will help the squid to caramelise on the barbecue. Also add a little vegetable oil and mix it in well. Use your hands if you need to. Perfect, I'm going to pop that onto my barbecue. Now the barbecue needs to be hot, or if you're doing it at home in a frying pan, it needs to be really hot. We want these to cook very, very quickly, about 30 seconds to a minute on each side. So, perfect, nice sizzle. It's exactly what I want to hear. Now I'm going to move on to my dressing. Now I'd normally use a blender, but because I'm here in Thailand, I'm going to use a pestle and mortar. In my pestle and mortar, I start with garlic and ginger. Then I add a spoonful of honey, some fish sauce, few glugs, don't overshake, otherwise it'll get too salty. Of course, you could use salt if you didn't have fish sauce. Throw in some chilli paste, squeeze in some lime juice, and mix it all together. And now it's time to add our oil. Now, I'm actually not going to use the, the pestle for this. I'm going to use a fork, because I want to get a really lovely emulsion. Just drizzle your oil in, whisking with the fork. Wow, 
Wow. The squid is beginning to get really charred and not burnt, but charred and taking on a wonderful colour. So all we've got to do now is assemble our salad. First, I thinly slice a couple of mild chilies, including the seeds. Then I throw in a peeled and de-seeded cucumber, some red pepper for colour, a handful of torn coriander, and some chopped spring onions. Now our squid is looking fantastic here, so I'm just going to take it out with my tongs. So really thinly shred. We want to have lots of really thin slices mixed with the salad. We don't want it to be huge lumps of squid and huge lumps of salad, so try and get everything a similar size. Now I'm just going to pop that into my salad. To ensure the salad looks its best, add the dressing at the last minute. Mix really well and then place into the centre of your serving plate. Sprinkle with some sesame seeds and a good squeeze of lime. Mmm! Now, that really is my kind of food. It's really quick to make, it's delicious flavours that are really punchy and to me that is definitely Thailand on a plate. You'll never go hungry in Thailand. There's always someone somewhere ready to feed you. The Thai generosity of spirit can be seen in the care and quality of their food, whether eating at a royal palace, at a Thai barbecue, or at a street stall. You always leave with a huge smile on your face. I think I finally understood the saying, Im Jai, full heart.